it's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with over 27 years of experience. Together, Henry and I are the Brief Brothers. We love talking about briefs, briefing, and advertising. Today, Henry, we have a guest who is a recent graduate of the University of Minnesota's Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication, a student, by the way, a former student recommended to us by our friend Mark Jensen. His name is Tyrese Leverty. He is a brand planner with Carmichael Lynch in Minneapolis. Let's join the conversation. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we are in our next episode of The Brief Brothers. Today, we're really excited to have a young guest. His name is Tyrese Leverty. He is a recent graduate. You're going to have to help me out here, Tyrese. A recent graduate at the University of Minnesota's Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication, or is it the other way around? I always get the two. Yes, that's correct. It's a long okay. one. So. Yeah, <laughs> and I was getting all. backwards. And he comes to us, Tyrese comes to us as a recommendation from our friend, uh, Mark Jensen, who has been a guest on our show. I routinely talk to his classes once a semester. And I think Mark was a pinch hitting, pinch hitted for Henry. Henry was uh, out of town uh, some time ago, and Mark was our guest host. He played, uh, he did the Joan Rivers thing to my really bad Ed McMahon. I don't know, whatever. Uh, so we know Mark. Mark nobody back. nobody knows what you're talking about. I know. I've just dated myself. And, and Tyrese is like, who the heck is he talking about? What? what? Uh, I know Joan Rivers, I promise. It's all it's all <laughs> okay. it, yeah, old TV. Old TV, she, she, Johnny she Carson. To, she used to she used to <laughs> guest host for Johnny Carson when right. he was when he was the the host of the Tonight Show, like yeah, two and, Tonight Show hosts ago. And everybody under 30 is saying, Johnny who? Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, we're what we're Tyrese. Welcome to the Brief Brothers. We're really excited to have you on our 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 show. Thank you so much, Howard. Thank you so much, Henry. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So let's let's dive in and explore a little bit about you, because since you are our guest, we're going to just be focusing in on you. What was it that that attracted you to the career you ha you have in advertising? And just as a little background, we know now that you are working at a major shop, a big shop a well-known shop in Minneapolis called um, Carmichael Lynch. That's a, I guess we could call it a legacy agency. Um, what got you interested? How did you find your way to Mark's class? Give us your background. We'd like to know. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of my favorite questions because uh, when I ever ask this question to people that I now work with, the answers vary so wildly. I always say like, it's it's almost so standard now that people are like, oh my gosh, I was not expected to end up right where I am right here. And now I'll tell you about this wild path that I took to get here. That is the standard now, right? Whereas before they were like, oh, it's unconventional that I took a straight shot to get here. So I'm one of those people that I have a little bit of a, a twisted path as well. Um, I did not grow up in a, a household that had parents that knew anything about the advertising industry, about creative work, about business or marketing or anything like that. So everything I had to do, I kind of had to carve out that space on my own, which definitely was difficult at times. Um, and I definitely had to use a lot of resources and people um, near me to help me out. But I really, really discovered through time and through exploration that I found a love, not necessarily just for advertising specifically, but I really found a love for language, communication, and even dialing into that further storytelling. I have such a passion and I recognized this when I was making that transition between high school and college for the power that stories have over our emotions and the things that we decide to do, the way that we present ourselves, the way that we communicate um, and the persona that we take on. All of those things, I feel like that is something that we look over to stories and the stories that we've been told through our childhood or even the stories in movies and media that we watch in our day-to-days and our times after a nine-to-five. I love that idea that we really craft ourselves based on the media and the world around us that we get to see and to have the ability to help to shape that always hopefully in a positive way. That was just something that I really, really latched onto and fell in love with. So the rest of my college years, I spent time trying to dig into that a little bit more, starting off with a communications major, then quickly deciding that like, hey, let's let's get smart about this. Let's see if we can dip our toes into a strategic communications major in the Hubbard School, as you've mentioned. And then even from there, uh, strategy and brand planning 
really seemed like it was was the next step. Although I do really have a huge passion for the creatives as well. I want to give a special shout out for them. I minored in a lot of creative things, including art and then design as well. So I do have a huge passion for that. Does this mean you had a hard time explaining to mom and dad what it is that you do or wanted to do? They didn't quite, <laughs> the creative, I mean, because I've heard that story a lot too. What, what yeah, exactly still is to this day, do? still to this day. <laughs> it's so, a tough thing to explain. It's reacting to a couple of things you said. One is I, I, I think that most people end up in advertising by accident. I mean, even people like David Ogilvy, I think he was like a restaurant chef or something like before he got into advertising. Um, you know, it's a it's a career that finds us in a lot of cases. We we don't find it. And then the other thing is that as a strategist, I think I think our closest kin in an agency are copywriters. Um, because so much of what we do overlaps with what they do in terms of that storytelling aspect, especially using words uh, to to shape a story, except our audience is them and their audience is the, the consumer. So um, I think that's a, been a repeat theme. I think starting from the very from the very first episode that we did that I think was what are the the characteristics of a good brief writer and and i said yeah to be a good brief writer you have to be a good writer yeah it's that's part of the skill so uh definitely uh relate to to what you said there so so tyrese uh how far along were you in your studies before you discovered mark's class it's a great question i would say it's pretty far along um you know to henry's point around advertising really discovering us. It was in my senior year, actually, when Mark and I met each other. And he's big. He's a big person on campus, right? He's always really involved with his students, which is something that I am so thankful for, because I was one of those students. But that wasn't until my senior year when I actually collaborated with him on our National Student Advertising Competition, or NSAC. Um, at that time, as I mentioned, I was still uh, teetering on the fence between whether to take a creative route or more account planning or strategy route. And so in NSAC, I actually was a creative art director and book designer. And then I tacked on the role of presenter at the very end of that. Um, and so him and I worked months on end, actually outside of the classroom and collaborated on that, that campaign. Let's, that remi let's remind our viewers, wh what is the name of the class that you took with Mark? Yeah, that one is the National Student Advertising Competition. I think it's a class now, but at that time, it was not a class. So it was something that was an extracurricular activity that we did outside of the classroom. And did you take other classes with Mark or was that, is that the one that you took? That's the one that I interacted with Mark on. The class that he teaches is account planning. Well, I think he, he, there's another one he teaches because that's the one that I talk to regularly. It's, and I, I've got it written down here somewhere, but I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's something about creative strategy. And it's it, it, it has a mixture of creatives and non-creatives in, in the class, mm. um, but it is about developing strategy because I think what they do is they take a project and they write, a, they write a brief for it and they do creative. So that's not the one that you took. You took not something else. Not okay. with Mark. Um, okay. I've taken a, I, a few of those classes, creative strategy for portfolio development, creative management, um, strategy man management things along those lines. And a lot of that was still in my my senior year. Um, but Mark and I's interaction was mostly in NSAC. And that was an incredible time where I still got to learn a ton from him there as well. Okay, so you have been out, you you graduated when and how, how long did it take you to, to land your job at Carmichael? Yeah, so I graduated in spring of 2021. It was a wild time. Yeah. <laughs> Just absolutely. Mm. You, you had the, the pandemic right at the peak of your college career. Yeah. Um, there toward the end. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I still have to count my, my blessings and still be grateful that, um, you know, I know that there are other people that maybe graduated the year prior to me. And that was the very first time that everyone was trying to figure it out that that spring of 2020 group of people. Um, so it was just a little more understandable, understandable about like, hey, this is what, you know, this is what the standard is. This is what we're doing. Uh, no real graduation ceremonies or anything like that. But um, of course, yeah, a totally different time than what was 2019 or 2023 where we are today. Related question. Right now, are you, do you go back to the office? Do you have to go to, into the office periodically or do you, do you have a hybrid uh, schedule? How's that work? 
Good question. I'm in the office now. Surprise. <laughs> um, and yes, I do not have, we have a, a work from where you need requirement or policy here at Comerica Lynch, which is one of the reasons I think we're really succeeding in, in these days where a lot of people like myself love being in the office occasionally. I love having the space to, you know, think big and have ideas written up on whiteboards and use paper and printers and silly things like that. But uh, not everybody has that perfect setup uh, in the office. Some people have kids and, you know, if you need to go pick them up from school or daycare. It's much better to do that a five, 10 minute drive from your house than maybe half an hour from the office. So did you great. did you intern there before you got the job or did you intern someplace else or how, how did you find your way to Carmichael? Yeah, after the graduation in spring 2021, I actually landed a internship here and was the brand planning intern here throughout the summer. So that was those three months over the summer. And then right from there, continued on with the assistant brand planning role that I have now uh, up until today. So it's been a very straight shot from my graduation here, which I feel very fortunate for. Um, but like I said earlier, I definitely think that if it wasn't for Mark Jensen and a couple of other very formative people that really helped me refine that trajectory in my senior year, this may look like something totally different, which is exciting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, as, a, as the creative, you know, here we are, there's three of us, and I'm the creative, and you two are, are strategists. So again, I'm the, I'm the ad guy out. Uh, although Henry and I share a passion for writing, so that's something that uh, we like to talk about. Um, you were debating for a while, maybe I should go to the creative route, maybe I should go to the planning route, or the strategy route, even though there's obviously overlap between the two. What tipped, what tipped the scales for you? Hmm, a really good question. It wasn't something that I was 100% certain of all the way through my internship. I know I had applied to several different roles, not only at Carmichael Lynch, but to all the agencies. And they varied from strategy or account planning to art direction was really the other one. And then I even had some other roles that I applied to that were like studio or like producing roles. Um, of that nature too. So it's not particularly just the creative house inside of agencies either that I was interested in. But I think for me, I started to recognize a pattern within myself, which is that I loved being creative as like a self-expression or a self-expressionary act. And that worked so much better when I was being creative for myself. And it worked a little more differently, I found over time when I was being creative inside an agency. Uh, whereas when I was thinking over into roles that were, land were landing closer to the strategy side of things, it was that I could still have that creativity and still be creative in my actions and my words, but I wasn't really tasked with that final output so much as I'm here and I get to be a creative collaborator. I'm still right there. I'm right next to that work as it's developing. And in fact, when I'm doing my best job, I get to see the coolest creative work come out of a brief that I've written or a conversation that I've had, or even a, a simple collaboration and a recommendation. Wow. I mean, that's, I, you know, we've had some conversations, Henry and I've had some conversations with some pretty astute, talented strategists over the last couple of years, but the words coming out of your mouth just have a unique twist to them that I just haven't heard from a strategist before. So I'm, first of all, my first the first conclusion I draw is you've got a side gig going here because you you have a creative express a need to express yourself creatively. So my guess is you're a writer, so you're doing some writing and maybe you're doing some art, some design, some jewelry, some painting. But that the some side the, hustle. Some yeah, side hustle. Whether you're going to try to make money off of it or not, I don't know. I mean, I get that. I'm now I'm no longer a working creative, and I'm. I become a memoirist. I'm writing. I'm using my skills and my gifts to write memoirs and to write stories about people that I know and love. I didn't think about doing that, well, kind of, while I was in the midst of my career. And now you're, you're there's an, a, a, I, I think, a maturity in your thinking that says, I can do this for a living or I can save that for myself and use the creativity of the strategy process and let that be enough. So that automatically leads me to our, a question about the creative brief, because that's what Henry and I love to talk about. Not everything, but you know, it's what got us started. 
What are your thoughts about this thing called a creative brief? When when were you first exposed to this this document and this process? And what do you think about it now? Are, do you think do you feel yourself as an astute writer? Who have you learned from? I got a ton of questions about your you know where this document fits into your thinking and your role at Carmichael. I love it. Yeah, let's dig in. And uh, really quickly before I answer that question, I would say I'm a huge fan of like the side hustle. I <laughs> love. I, I always tell people I have more passions than I think I have time for, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think that's a lot of us inside this industry as. We're such creative people. We have so many things always swirling around in our head. And so the ability for us to do so many different things with that information or those thoughts is really, it seems like endless. And for me, that comes in the form of music. So I'm a drumline instructor outside of this. And that's really where I get to have that creativity is it's not just what most people assume is drumline, um, which is like standing out on the football field during halftime. That is part of my, my work. But the other half of it is competitive indoor drumline that is much more theatrical, much more story driven. And we create props and have narration and the lights. There's a whole, the whole shebang. So that's, I'm sure you can imagine where a lot of that creativity comes into. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to have to Google that and, and see some yeah. demonstrations of that. Cause yeah. you're right. I, I initially just thought, you know, marching band type stuff outdoors. Oh, there's, there's some very popular movies. I don't know. They're quite old now in the nineties or two thousands about drumline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and I, I don't know why they disappeared because it was like these move these series of movies that were inspired by um, Center Stage, with uh, uh, Zoe Saldana and and those you know it was around ballet at the time, but that yep. inspired a lot of other movies about dancing as a career, and then it kind of puttered out. But I also saw some of these movies you were, that referred to Drumline, and was intrigued by it. So did, was that was that influence? Did that influence you? These movies. A different it? era, a different era. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. we don't see that much. We see much more Super Mario, the movie, and other things like that these days. Or shit, <laughs> or shit like that. <laughs> That's, what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing. And all, of course, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, all of those universes. But yeah, I would say it did not influence me. I actually, a fun fact is that I just watched Drumline the movie last year. So I was a fraud really? up until this point, but I've been in, in <laughs> a percussion. And you were the real, you were the real thing. Don't worry. Yeah. 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 You found, you found it all by yourself. Yeah. You yeah. found it all by yourself. Good for you. I okay. Did, I did. So, so let's, yeah. let's, let's connect, let's connect your creativity to the creative process around the brief. Um, yeah. What, what was, what was the when were you first exposed to this thing called a brief what did you think of it um and how have you what have you learned about it as a as someone who writes brief what is your role do you write briefs you, do you contribute to briefs now talk to us about that yeah so i would say the first time that i was really introduced to a brief was probably in college uh, we had one of those classes that i mentioned earlier that was specifically like designed for getting different iterations of brief writing. Uh, and that was really, really helpful. And not only walking through the elements of a brief and talking about the audience to our goal to, you know, whatever else you want to include in a brief is everyone's is slightly different and what they, they want to put in it. But it was really helpful to have a few at bats to try to write some of those ourselves for different mock brands. I think I remember doing Converse and Airbnb are, are the two brands that I remember at the time, as those two were pretty popular. So that was helpful in introducing me to a brief. The second half of your question is very interesting to me. How much, how much am I working with it these days? Um, because the answer is, it depends. I would say in my years since I graduated, I've really found that a brief is really helpful for some people and some industries, both you know, advertising and others, um, and also some roles for the creatives. Sometimes they really enjoy that. Sometimes they don't. But I would say it's not always the single solution for every conversation or everything that you're trying to do. Um, or even if it is, it doesn't have to look exactly like the singles page that we've always seen um, when we were looking up a creative brief. And that's the first thing that pops into the Google machine. So one thing that I really, really am um, excited about in my role is that I do create briefs, but they're not always that single page. A lot of them are pictures or images, um, a few slides and that type of a template, still brief in itself is always the goal, but uh, they don't always have to be written, which 
I think my love for storytelling does not just come out in my love for writing, but also oral storytelling and pictures and using memes or GIFs or other things too, as I think those are, are much uh, clearer testaments into culture. When you can see an image that reminds you of maybe a movie that you've seen or a different place or a different stage of life that you maybe once had. So I'm very passionate about that. I've definitely seen all of uh, the templates from people like Julian Cole. Um, and I still do think that there's a lot of good goodness in briefs in general, but I haven't really been tasked in my role here of specifically doing a ton of the single page writing of briefs. I've done quite a few of them, but uh, I wouldn't say that it's a, a main pillar of my job in that format. I'm curious. I mean, maybe this is my me being the oldest here and the and the old guy in the in the room. Um, I do obviously have a bias for the written document. Uh, I remember reading a little booklet that a creative director who started an agency in Boston called Hill Holiday Cosmopolis and something else. Connors Cosmopolis. It, Hill yeah. Holiday Connors Cosmopolis. Connors Cosmopolis. I took a workshop from from Stavros Cosmopolis. This is a brilliant I, creative. I worked, talked to, I, worked, I worked for Jack Connors for okay. a time. Yeah. So this is a workshop I took in, when I was at an agency in Chicago in the early 90s. So this is, you know, long time ago. And I've talked about these little booklets that I took from his workshop. I still have them. I don't have them right in front of me. But Kos, Stavros Cosmophilus was an art director. But his bias was toward writing. Because he said there are certain images that do not convey universally the way a word does. And the example he used at the very end of the book, this is a, this is a tiny book, you know, just a, a, a small run that he would, he would hand out at his workshops. And I forget the name of this particular one, but he said, words are more powerful than pictures because they don't always convey, or because pictures don't always convey the universality that we're trying to use when we do advertising. And he says, a classic example he said, the two words that I can, I think, demonstrate this is your mother. There's no picture that would be universal to convey that other than those two words. Because when you say your mother, you have a very specific image. Or there's no picture that would demonstrate your mother other than your, a picture of your mother. Which leads me to ask, when you are doing a brief that is built around images, which I think is a cool idea. I, I you know, creatives are creatives crave some kind of spark that's what we want but we also want clarity do you see the day i'm playing devil's advocate here do you see the danger that the images that you produce or create or, or present to our creative team do not have that universality has that been a problem or the clarity or the clarity yeah it's a it's a fair question and uh there's always a balance with it too you know i mentioned as well that it's such a nuanced conversation. It's probably one why it's, it's coming up in, in this conversation between the three of us. And one maybe you've asked other people too, because there's no universal answer to what a brief is and what it should look like. And I think there's some beauty in that. I love working within an industry that there is not always a single right answer. It's more of a, an art than it is a, a perfect formula or science, which is great. I would say you're 100% right that that balance needs to be tweaked back and forth to not 100% be images solely. Um, and I think maybe there could be some room in the future. I don't know exactly if it's going to work for everyone, but for the brief that we've come to know, a single written one, to maybe uh, utilize some imagery as well. But you're well, right, it's sometimes challenging too, to give them the imagery already up front, um, as maybe that could be limiting, and maybe it doesn't allow them for that full ability to creatively express themselves or think about the imagery that comes to their mind, as you mentioned with the example of your mother. One of the one of the things Howard and I, you know, talk about routinely, and in fact, in the intro to every show, we say we like to talk about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. So, to me, briefing is a different thing than the brief, right? Um, and so what I would encourage you and any young uh, strategist is not to be, I, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to be the curmudgeon that says you must be wed to this document or this format or whatever we, in fact, we, we say formats are like 
you could take your pick of formats, but most creative brief formats have a few general things in common that are over time have been proven to be the necessities of what you need to communicate to start a community uh, a creative assignment. Um, but what I do typically is I write, I workshop my brief in a word document, like in a te the, one of the templates or whatever, but the briefing can always be different. And so it's for me, the document is like the scratch pad where I'm, I'm doing the work. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud, I'm editing, I'm copying, I'm pasting, I'm getting, and then, Depending on where that goes, I'll create a briefing uh, document, and it's usually a PowerPoint or a keynote or something like that. Then the reason I do that is just strategically. I started in the business, you know, used to pass out, go to the Xerox. You talked about you, you know, using paper. We used to make Xerox copies of the brief and pass them out around the table, and the creators would go right to the single-minded proposition, read it, and then tune out for the rest of the meeting. So what I do is I I like to reveal the brief sequentially and tell that story sequentially. And one of the good things about you know Keynote and and PowerPoint and things like that is you can bring in visuals to help accentuate gifts from the internet. I mean, there's a, a way I think of briefing in a modern way that feels like you're borrowing from the pop culture. You're using gifts from Twitter or, or, or Instagram or whatever, and loading them in, into the, into the, but then you're revealing the brief sequentially. So I would. Well, what, what Henry's uh, not telling you, Tyrese, is that he's a control freak. He likes to dribble <laughs> things out like a Chinese, you know, like a drip, drip, drip. <laughs> no, I, I just, I want, I like, I, I don't want them to fast forward to the end of the movie and, <laughs> and then, and then, and then tune out the, the whole rest of the movie. So, yeah, no, I, I, but I, I do recommend that you have as a backstop a document because one of the things we also talk about a lot is the brief is kind of a contract. And if, and if it's up to too much interpretation, it's hard to hold them down when they don't live up to their end of the contract. They could yeah. say, well, this is the, you gave us a brief and this is the direction I took it in. And again, I'm also not dogmatic that they can't leave the, the, the breadcrumb path that I've led for them with the brief. Um, because I've often said, if they come back with an idea that isn't on brief, but is better than, whatever I was thinking was the direction, I'm always going to be open to it. Uh, I don't, th I think it's a mistake for strategists to be dogmatic about their briefs, but I think it starts at least the, the, that organic iterative creative process with everybody understanding at least what the initial expectation is. If they come back and blow you away with something you had never thought about, that's something else, but that's and, my two and cents and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, and just I don't want to monopolize this because I want to hear from you, Tyrese. But Henry and I did have done at least two episodes using briefs written by Crispin Porter Bogusky back in their heyday in the mid two thousands, and their template is different from anything I've ever seen. Maybe Henry has seen similar briefs. Different templates, so yeah. They have a unique perspective on their template, which requires a bit of it's a bit of a learning curve to figure out how they do it and their language how it what lang, what the language they use to translate fits what we expect to see in a brief an outsider once, doesn't get it yeah an outsider. Yeah, right away and and i've been fooled by it and henry's kind of steered me back to what i would what i thought it meant and he said no this probably means this and it's like okay i get it now but if you were in that culture and immersed in it you'd figure it out eventually but it just shows you, to your point, Tyrese, that there's no, and we talk about this too, there's no one way to do this. And that's a good thing. That's hard. Marketers have a hard time dealing with that, though. They want formulas. They're comfortable with something that's A plus B equals C. Clients, in other words. Cl clients AK, and marketers. AK. Yeah. They're, they're more linear in their thinking where we are not exactly. So I would say I salute you for looking for other ways but there's this part of me, and Henry expressed it too, be careful, because what creatives want is clarity minimum, but a little spark if you can do it. And if you can do that through non-written words, traditional ways, God, we, we want it. We want it. Um, I love it. Yeah, both both really good points from both of you. And I think what you're saying, Henry, specifically on that briefing process versus the brief itself is 
is so key, right? Where is where is the line uh, where you can use the the supplemental imagery and you can use the tactic of of a reveal, which is so fun and. I don't think that's too controlling. I'll I'll put my my stamp down here, but uh, I like any it. any presentation, right? You want to you want to <laughs> control it and and tell the story in your own way. I and that's a, a storyteller does of... the same thing, right? We we uh, we have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the end is supposed to have some kind of wrapping things up or revealing yeah. something. Yeah, so I love it. It's dramatic. Like to Henry that's, that's what I'm here for in terms of this is the storyteller guy <laughs> over here. I love the dramatics of that. So that's fun, but. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think every time that I have uh, written a brief in terms of like the document that we're all talking about, it's definitely been really eye opening. And I love that both of you are acknowledging too that there are some that work for processes and some that work for creatives and teams and other versions that maybe don't. And I'm very grateful and glad to be at a stage of my career where I'm open to that. I'm, I'm excited about trying new things and learning new ways to do that. And so I appreciate your your notes on that as well, as well. And I'm very excited to see what my next stage looks like and what kind of feels best to me. Do you have a a kind of a mentor? Mark Mark Jensen aside, um, is there someone in the industry whose briefs you admire? Have you had a chance to put name and brief together so you know that this person wrote a brief? Yeah, I have not seen his briefs yet, admittedly, but my mentor, who I actually started with at the Hubbard School, is Nitin Dua, uh, who used to work at Fallon, then Johannes Leonardo, currently at Mojo Supermarket, and uh, he is a strategist there. And like I said, I haven't seen his briefs, but the two of I are the two of us are connected. Okay, well, I I asked that because in the last few weeks. I was able to meet the the author of a brief that I had been using as a teaching tool for years and for years didn't know who wrote it. Her name is Sarah Walker Hall. She works for um, the Richards Group TR, TRG in Dallas. And the brief is for a, a little packaged good called Kiwi Shoe Polish. You know, this seemingly insignificant little product but her brief, and by the way, what, what what also makes it significant to me, I think to Henry as well, this was her first brief, her very first brief. And, and it was it, how, how many years ago, Howard? 20. 20 Early years ago. 20, 2003, 2004, I think was when she wrote this brief. They had just won the account, and she was part of the pitch team. And I think uh, Christopher Owens, who hired her as her boss, or was her boss, maybe still is her boss, uh, assigned her the task of being the strategist that pitched the account and her contributions to the pitch um, helped them win the piece of business. And so this was the first assignment I've, I've since learned. This was the first assignment. So it's cool to finally put a face and a brief together because like all advertising, unless you read the award books, we're not, they're not signed. You know, a Matisse and a Picasso and a and Renoir are signed. We, we know who I, the artist is. I, I, and as we've discovered with, with you and the Creative Brief Archive, you know, trying to put a library of briefs together, they're hard to come by. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. You know, these are tend to be, you know, protected because of industry trade secrets and stuff like that. But even, you know, so what we get our hands on are some of the older ones. Of course, some of the older ones are some of the, the, the better ones. Mm -hmm. Um, But... You know, it's interesting because when I was a young strategist, I I basically decided to occupy that position in the agency because we didn't have uh, account planning, as it used to be called at the time, uh, strategy. And um, so I just kind of filled that gap and I didn't have a mentor. Like the closest thing I had to a mentor was uh, there was this older gentleman named John Kane, and he was a media uh, planner buyer. And he kind of knew how to work with consumer data. And he was the one that like taught me like my first lessons about birds of a feather flock together. If you know uh, consumers of a certain brand look and act this way, then people that look and act that way that aren't consumers of the brand are probably the lowest hanging fruit to convince uh, to buy your brand. And so he taught me a few like heuristics that, that started me off on the path. But back then, I mean, 
the internet was brand new. There wasn't anywhere near the amount of knowledge available. There was no LinkedIn. There was no way that I could, you know, just tap in. There weren't uh, people, uh, you know, doing the kinds of training that, frankly, you're doing, Howard, or that Julian Cole, who we just mentioned, we're trying to get as a guest on on the show, uh, do. So I think my other piece of advice to young strategists is to take advantage of the fact that you have resources like LinkedIn where you can reach out to people and say, hey, I'm an admirer of the work your agency does. Can you share a brief with me? I'll keep it in confidence. I'll, you know, uh, just to- And then send it to me. Yeah, oh yeah, send it to Howard <laughs> so you can put it at the Creative Brief Archive and then they'll never share another brief with you again. Exactly, I know, but, I know. <laughs> but uh, I, I, think, I, I think that uh, it's an exciting time actually to be a strategist mm-hmm. because there is, you know, I was like toiling around, you know, trying to reading books. I mean, that's how I met Howard. I found his book on Amazon and bought it. And uh, we became fast friends pretty quickly after that. But yeah. uh, I, I think mentorship is a big part. I, it, I wasn't, it wasn't until I was at my third agency that I had a boss that was actually a strategist and that I had strategy colleagues around me like up until that point i was just like a like a lone gunman um which is kind of unnerving because you don't know if you're doing it right so Mm -hmm. i've had the best of both worlds kind of self-teaching but also learning from some some pretty good and some pretty smart people do you you agree tyrese with what henry said that this is an exciting time to be a strategist do you do you feel that way yeah i do because not only do i agree that platforms like linkedin are so helpful in connecting people and you know you mentioned him, Julian Cole um, and others have made that, you know, their primary strategy and speaking of strategy to really say, hey, let's speak to these people because we all know that they're connected and they're looking for connection and uh, information. And so let's talk about what we all do in common and have have in common. So I love that. Um, I also love the opportunity that I get to just be in a landscape with so many brands and so many different forms of media. Like we're surrounded at every moment of our, our day with different brands and the content that they're producing and uh, the stories that they're trying to tell and get your attention for. And of course, as an advertiser, I'm like, this is exciting. Of course, as maybe some other people, a consumer, they might be like, this is overwhelming. But, uh, you know, what I enjoy doing is telling the stories that hopefully are not irritating, hopefully get to that, that deeper emotional state of where people are so that they don't feel like, oh, this is an ad and I want to turn it off. It's, this is an ad and maybe I can't pull my my eyes away from it because it feels so true or it feels so right. It feels like it's hitting a deeper emotional um, and human truth and level. So I love that. And I feel like that's really the era that we're, we're in right now. I can't say what that's going to look like in the future. I can't wait, but it feels exciting to be where we're at. So you're comfortable selling things. Yeah, <laughs> I think you kind of have to be uh, in my my line of work. I would say I feel comfortable selling ideas more than necessarily products. You know, I've worked well, at, no, I've worked let, at selling uh, you know products. Let's drill down. Let's explore. Let's explore that because one of the the right. first question that I usually ask when I talk to Mark's class on creative strategy, and I, I apologize, Mark, I'm getting the title of, the, of your class wrong, but he is accustomed to me asking the question, "How many of you, can you describe what it means to be a capitalist, and would you call yourself a capitalist?" Interesting. You're asking that of me now. I'm asking that of you right now. Do you know what cap? What, what is your definition of capitalism? I would say the the system that we've set up to buy and sell goods or exchange exchange goods uh, for okay the benefit of of ideally everyone, but in today's society, maybe not everyone. So well, I'm gonna we, we can, I'm, we can, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get I'm, on my soapbox. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, no, I just, I just, I, I want to, and I want to be really diplomatic about this. I, I do think when you join the advertising agency business, make no mistake about it. You are a cog in the machine of capitalism. Um, I justify that very easily because more than a system we've set up, it's frankly the, the default system, right? Like when you give people freedom to do things, it's the system you get. Um, we everything that we buy was made by somebody. And so 
well, when, when we're marketing and advertising stuff, we are, we are uh, helping those people who are putting their labor and their time and their energy and their intellectual property into a product uh, to help promote it so that people can find it and buy it. And this is all done on a voluntary basis. Nobody tells you which brand of toothpaste to buy, which brand of toilet paper to buy, which home computer to buy or whether to buy a home computer or a car um of course you know people argue there are uh advertising makes you want things that you don't need well yeah it does but maybe the again, first time maybe the first time but, but there's an old saying in the business the best the best way to kill a bad product is with good advertising you can't yeah. get someone to try it twice if it doesn't if it sucks um but I, I think that beyond that, there's a more judgmental kind of view of like, well, you don't need a car. Well, that's up to the per I would say that's up to the person to decide whether they need mm -hmm. a car or not. Um, so I, 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 I often refer to this anecdote and um, it's something that stayed with me. There's, there was a famous Argentine creative director, very award winning. And he was like, I think 25 years into the business and he wrote a long piece like and it was a memory that he had from earlier in his career where he went to buenos aires he had the nestle client um as as a client and they had a, a brand of ice cream and they went to visit the plant him and the people from the agency went to visit the plant and the, the plant manager said who here is in charge of the creative and he you know raised his hand and he brought him into the room like where all the workers were were making the ice cream and he says this is where these people work and this is how they make their living. He's like, we have one shift working. If you guys do a great campaign, we could afford to buy a second shift and there'll be a whole other group of people making a living in this plant. And he says, and if you do a stellar job, we'll have three shifts and we'll be making ice cream around the clock. And all those people will be able to feed their families and take care of their responsibilities. And so he talks about the campaign and how it was a great campaign and how it became very, a very successful uh, brand in Argentina. And he says, don't let people trivialize what we do. What we do is to help other people sell their wares to other people on a voluntary basis. So that's kind of my my spiel. I think, unfortunately, in a lot of university settings and and a lot of educational settings, it's there's kind of a death wish there. Like everything we have is because of this hated thing called capitalism, and they're ready to kill it. And it's like everything we have in modernity almost comes from that. So, um, I, I I say to people, I say I sleep very well at night because I know that what I'm. What I'm doing is morally in line with what I what I perceive to be good and right. A command system where you have to do things that the, somebody is dictating to you, that would be the worst possible thing for me. Yeah, that's strong. And I, I love the, the story that you're telling there too. And to connect it with uh, Howard, you'd mentioned like nobody, nobody buys something that's advertised twice even if it's not a good product right or especially if it's not a especially good product if it's not yeah right i i think that that's really where i'm sitting as well with it as well uh where i feel like my job is not just to sell the product right otherwise we would be selling maybe not a lot of not great products and then that's where i would start to feel a lot of that guilt but it's to come to that higher order where the if we're doing our job the consumer or the person we're marketing to is able to see through a reflection of that product onto their own set of beliefs and their own values and dictate if we're doing our job correctly through the advertising and through that communication, whether or not that product is even right for them in the first place. So I'm not trying to sell people things to your earlier points that like they don't need or maybe that they don't want, um, but something that does fulfill a, a need or something that's deeper, a human emotion to them. Um, I'm hoping that it's never like, oh, we're selling this to you because we need the money from you rather than you actually needing this product as well. It's a balance, right? The consumer need, the company need. Uh, let me, uh, the and let me. The, 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 tr the truth though is though, Tyrese, when you're, when you're starting out in your career as you have, you have almost no choice in the products that you have to sell. True. So one of the things I say to the students in Mark's class and others, and I did this with a couple of classes at the University of Tampa recently, my, my my alma mater, 
And back to back, the difference between the two classes was stark. Because I asked the question, do you call yourself capitalist? And about 80% of the first class raised their hand and said, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with capitalism. Second class, no one raised their hand. So it was stark difference. But my question to them is, would you feel comfortable selling Pop-Tarts or toothpaste? You know, we don't always get to sell. I worked on the, the Lexus account. I've worked on British Airways. I've worked on some sexy national, international, international brands. I've never had to work on a piece of business, a product or a service that I didn't believe in. I never had to work for a, you know, a cigarette company or something along those lines. And that's been very fortunate. But, I, you know, you go to the work for an agency. If you want to work for the agency, you work for the clients they have. You don't have an option in that, and especially young people. And that may make them uncomfortable, especially if they have uh, political aspirations, if they are believe in social justice or racial justice or, or, or economic justice and things those like that. You're going to have to be pretty senior before you get to work on those sexy pro bono accounts, if ever. So yeah. having said, having said it like that, you're still, you're still comfortable. You're still uh, feeling positive and optimistic about what you can do in your role as a strategist at, at Carmichael Lynch. Yeah. And the effect that I can have on, on the work that we do. I think that we have a very team-based dynamic where um, everyone contributes to work, especially within the main client that I work on. And um, while no, not everybody has 100% the right answer, it's through that collaboration, everyone putting different ideas out there, regardless of level or um, title, where we create the best output. And I think it's exciting, too, to have that type of dynamic as it feels very fresh. Um, it's like I mentioned, the only one that I've ever known. And luckily it is for a brand that I do believe in. Um, it's part of our job too, rather than just the product side of things to find the right customer um, as well. Like you can't control the product, but through our messaging and because we do so much work with audiences, we have to make sure that the people who we're trying to target and speaking to are actually the right people who are going to feel like, yes, I'm inclined to buy this this product too. It's not just the product itself that, that matters in that equation. So um, yeah, I feel I feel very optimistic and maybe a little bit of that is my my youth and my naivety, but um, I'm excited. I, no, I, no, I wanna, I, I, wanna I wanna tag on to uh, something that, that Howard said. Uh, I, I, I was by no means saying that that every brand or every product has something redeeming to it. There are certainly products that are don't have red. And in my career, for, I've been fortunate that I've only ever had to reject working on one assignment um, because it was uh, morally abominable to me. And I'm, I don't want to get into what it was. But I, 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 you know, told the boss I'm not going to do it, and he ended up hiring a freelancer, um, and that's fine uh, for that. But I think really the the bigger thing is what I, Howard was kind of leaning into is mo the, the real thing I think is that most students believe that they're going to be working on Nike and Apple and most products that we work with are really a lot more benign and, and less known and sexy than, than those, right? So, yeah. you know, you're going to be working for, and I think the Kiwi shoe polish is a great example of that because Kiwi shoe polish to do a great campaign for Kiwi shoe polish, that's a big thing. To do a great campaign for a client that buys great stuff like Nike, and believe me, I've done, I've sold I sold work to Burger King that won a lion at can, but we went and pitched it to Burger King because we knew they bought great work. So that's different than trying to get a day to day client, you know, with a, a a brand like like Kiwi shoe polish to do something breakthrough, innovative. And, and creative. So, um, a, a, an example that I that I give is one of the most creative brands now is Old Spice. But it wasn't always that way. When Wyden and Kennedy won that piece of business around, I want to say it was like 2006. That brand was nowhere. It was an old brand that was stodgy, stale. Didn't have new product innovation. Uh, it was for old men. It didn't. And they created an entire campaign that basically made the brand relevant for a whole new generation. So they took a boring category of deodorant and made celebrities out of it, made themselves famous out of it, um, it you know, made the, the, the brand viable again. So when you see 
brands that are nowhere and then they're put on the map. Uh, it's easy to see in retrospect, like uh, Howard and I recently did an episode where we talked about BMW, the ultimate driving machine. That brand was nowhere when that campaign launched. 50 and, years ago. Yeah, it's in the 19, 1974. And, um, and that agency, um, there was a couple of weeks from insolvency. They pitched the business they wanted with this brilliant line that was true to the brand and created one of the most legendary brands. And, and I think at that time, in like in 1974, BMW was like the 11th best selling European car in America. So not even imported, like of the Europeans it was the 11th. And then, you know, a few, just a few short years ago, BMW was the number one premium, uh, you know, car in America. Uh, so taking a brand from nowhere, I, that to me is the hero stories of advertising, what ad, good advertising can do. There was a good product. People didn't know about it. And now we, they had a good message. Dos Equis is another one, right? It was a beer that was sold in America for 20 years. And then suddenly in the hands of a really gifted creative shop, uh, the most interesting man in the world is born and it becomes the best selling imported beer in, in America in a matter of a few years. So um, when done right, advertising can take good products and and really put them on the map. Yeah. 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 And that's something that I love both of those two examples. Um, and that's something that inspires me and, and gives me hope uh, within this state of capitalism as we've been talking about uh, to, to make a difference. And that's something I love too, is, you know, there's a lot of back and forth between like a strategist and account planner, a brand planner. My role is, is specifically a brand planner. And I think that's something that feels right to me because everything you're describing is really transforming those, those brands and our association with them um, more so than just the product itself. And that's something that is really eye-opening to me and makes, as you saw, me smile. So I appreciate you sharing those those stories, Henry, and I look forward to hopefully uh, doing uh, work. End of, uh, end of filibuster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Tyrese, you've been, you've been out of school now for a couple of years and working in, in a major shop. This is going to be a, it, it is a huge feather in your cap, which speaks to your your background, your skills, and your bosses see something really good in you. So kudos on you. When you go back to talk to Mark's classes or others, um, what kind of questions are you hearing from the students? Is there do you see a difference in the way uh, the young people who aspire to your your industry or are they reflecting the same kind of questions that you had when you were their age? You know that in itself is a really good question and you'll have to follow up with me as well. After, after I go next Tuesday, I'm, it's right around the corner. I'm going to go check in with them. But from my past visits, I'll tell you this. It seems like students these days, one, have a much more clear understanding of what account planning or strategy is than students in years past. As Henry has shared, you know, we've had a slow crawl toward more and more support for this type of a role in uh, our advertising world over time, and that hasn't always been the case. So that's been helpful to see programs like the Stratcom program at the Hubbard School become developed specifically for this. Um, the other thing is they're less so interested in like, what does a brief look like? Uh, what, what does my day-to-day -day look like? They're more interested in how I'm working rather than what specifically I'm working on. And perhaps that's because they understand the nature of the sensitivity of, of business that we have to align ourselves with. But um, it really feels like these days, most people are open and flexible to doing whatever within this industry, um, as long as they get to hopefully be creative or do something that feels right to them. But it feels like most people are putting a priority on working at a place where they prioritize the people's needs or their employees' needs. And mm -hmm. whether that's a good work-life balance, whether that's, you know, you'd ask me if I work from home or work from the office, uh, regardless of, of which of those were and are true, it seems like that's an important consideration from a lot of students. So yeah. I go back, those are the biggest questions they have. They can, they can read up on, you know, what a strategist is and, and all of that stuff online through people like Julian Cole, as we've mentioned several times here. But I think for me, they're most curious about 
what does it feel like to work at this company that I work at? And what's what advice do you give to the students who you talk to about their future, about the about the industry? It's a it's a piece of advice that I oftentimes have to remember myself too. So I'll share it here as a reminder for myself and for those listening that for students especially that are right on the precipice of like their next adventure, their next big thing, I always try to remind them that this is just your next step, right? All you're doing is just your next step. As sometimes it can feel like once you're graduating, it's your final step, right? Wherever you end up after this, it's going to determine the rest of your life, which in some regards, sure, it can. But I always have to remind people to that point that we started with at the beginning of the episode, the path to advertising is not typically a linear one. And so wherever you go from your studies or even from not your studies, just remember to keep taking that next step that's right in front of you. And that's something that always inspires me and something that I think resonates well with students when they ask too. Wow. Well, Tyrese Leverty, brand strategist at Carmichael Lynch in Minneapolis and a fairly recent student of Mark Jensen's classes at the University of Minnesota's Hubbard School. Thank you for joining Henry and me on The Brief Brothers. It's been great. Thank you, Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Ibach. And together, we're The Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>